Matthew 13, verse 1 through 23. On the same day, Jesus went out of the house, and he sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat, and he sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold! A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, for they didn't have much earth, and they immediately sprang up, and because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no root, and they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when the disciples came, they said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and you shall not understand. And seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see the things which you see, and did not see them, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one, that is the devil, comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while for when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And we will stop there this morning. Father, we are just so thankful to gather together. Lord, we just pray that you would superintend our minds. Give us the exact words to speak this morning. Give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is trying to communicate to us. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus precious name, and everyone said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, last Sunday evening, for those of you uh, who were here, you will remember that I preached from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And we talked about how Isaiah became keenly aware in the presence of the Lord that he was a man of unclean lips and that he walked among people of unclean lips, 
and that once the Lord had purged his mouth, okay, he heard a voice saying, who will go for us? Who will I send? And then Isaiah responded, here am I, Lord, send me. Now that is important because the very message that Isaiah was to communicate is the very prophecy that Jesus said is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 13. These people were hearing, but they were not understanding. They were closing their eyes to the truth. They were refusing to allow the word to make an impact on their life. Now understand this morning that I can stand up here and I can talk until doomsday, so to speak, but my words, unless it is based on God's word, has no power to change anybody. Who would say amen to that? Now, I'd like to think I'm a fairly decent speaker and maybe I'm fairly decent uh, at maybe persuading people. But my words have no power to change a person. They have no power to make you more like Christ. It doesn't make any difference how many illustrations I come up with. It is the word of God alone that will change us. And it is the word of God that we need. Now I want you to notice, God said, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah again responded, here am I, send me. And he sends them a message. He brings this message, okay? And this message that he brings, I dare say, was not for the faint of heart because he is challenging the people in the way they are responding to the word of God. He is letting them know, Jesus is letting them know that they are hearing the word of God, but the word of God is not bringing forth fruit in their life. I was talking about our, to our sister this morning about some of the things going on. She talks about uh, some of the things that happen on their farm. But I will tell you this, or I'll, maybe I'll just ask it as a question. Why does a farmer plant his seed? Because he expects a crop. Isn't that right? When we're driving down I-29, we were looking just this morning. My wife looked over and she said, what's that over there? It was something real bright yellow. I said, I have no idea. It might be soybeans. Might be alfalfa, I'm not a farmer, I don't know. But I'll tell you this, the farmer planted it because he expected the crop. He expected something to come forth. And when God sends his people, and he, when, when Jesus himself was sowing the word, he expected that that word would bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold in the life of the people who were hearing. You see, Jesus again was quoting Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Now the consequence of having God's word and not responding rightly is to harden our heart before the Lord. Now, I heard our, our, our pastor Birch years ago, and I remember him saying this many times. I understand that he was 30 odd years in the pulpit in the home church. And I sat behind him and I couldn't even begin to count how many messages I heard him preach. But I heard him say this many times. He said, one of these days, I'm gonna preach a message called Gospel Hardened. Gospel Hardened. You know, saints, you can hear something so many times that it just kind of goes in one ear and right out the other. And we don't allow God to truly deal with us regarding his word. Our heart can become hardened. Think about this morning, all the messages that you have heard in your lifetime. Think about it. Think about how many times you have been in God's word. Maybe think about times you've heard a message on the radio. Or maybe you saw something on television. And when you were listening to, to that word or you were reading in God's word, God showed you something about your life. 
Or maybe he showed you something about your personality and character. And he is wanting to change it. He's wanting to make an alteration. I remember when we lived in uh, uh, Independence and where we raised all of our children. We had a yard out front. And, and I tell you what, I must have sowed probably a hundred pounds of seed, maybe more than that, on that front yard over the, over the course of many years. And it was a tiny little yard. But there was a big massive tree that must have been probably six feet in diameter. That, I mean, it was so big it would take three or four people to get your hands around it that sat right in the middle. And I could never get anything to grow in that yard. You see, there was something there that was taking away the nutrients, taking away the sunlight, taking away the water that the grass seed needed in order to grow. And a lot of times I was kind of careless. I would just go out there, well, if you know, if I just put maybe 10 pounds down this time, at least we'll get something. <laughs> no, I think the birds got something, but I doubt that, that the yard didn't get much. And the yard was, was almost dirt at one time, and it was a very frustrating situation. But I read a passage of scripture in the Old Testament. The prophet is telling the people, he is saying, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. I was watching this video last week where these men had reconstructed this steam tractor. And I mean, this thing must have weighed, I don't know how many tons. And they set a new world record for the most plows. I guess it would be the, the actual plow portion. There's a name for it. Uh, on one plow that had ever been plowed. I mean, it was like he was pulling a trail that looked like it was probably 40 uh, 40 yards wide as he was pulling with this massive steam vehicle. You say, well, why were they doing it? Because you have to prepare the ground, saints, before the seed will ever take hold. How many of you know you don't throw the corn on top of the ground? You've got to create a rut. You've got to create a spot for it to be planted, and then they would put the dirt back over the top. In our hearts have to be prepared to receive God's word whenever he speaks. Because if not, the devil will just come and he will steal the word right out of our heart and we will miss it. Think about how many times you've been in a service and God was speaking to you and you, and you, you were sitting there and God was really showing you something. Maybe you wrote it down on a piece of paper or maybe you just kept it in mind. But by the time we get to the parking lot, saints, how many of you know, a lot of times it is far from us. And we never really give God the time to deal with our hearts. And we need to do that. We need to allow the word of God to penetrate and to change us. You see, the seed is good. You see that? The seed is good. But what about the ground? What about the heart? What about the heart condition? You see, self-hardening happens, saints, when we resist the Holy Spirit as he's trying to apply the word to our heart. I'll tell you right now, I would not be here this morning if when I read God's word, when I was just a young man, God had, had put me in a place where he had my undivided attention. I started reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and I can tell you, I would not be here this morning if I would have resisted the Holy Spirit when he would point something out about my heart in from his word and I didn't respond rightly. I knew I needed to get my heart right with God. I knew I was tired of playing games and I was ready to go forward in God. And that's what it took. God showed me in his word. He put the word into my heart and it began to bring forth fruit. We're going to change metaphors. You see, God gave Israel just 10 words. We were talking about planting seed. Now we're going to start talking about writing the word of God down. God gave Israel just 10 words. We call it the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on tablets of stone. Have you ever wondered how difficult that would have been? Now, God could do it with his finger. The next thing you know, it's just all written out. But what about for Moses? 
it would have been hard. You see, these stone tablets, in my view, were symbolic of the people's hearts. You see, God wanted to write his word on their hearts. He wanted the word to become part of their very being. So they didn't have to think about it. It became second nature. It was in their heart. I've, I've said this many times, you know, when was the last time you called somebody who was living a life of sin and just said, hey, I just wanted to follow up with you, make sure you're still in sin. Hmm? Anybody ever do that? Why? Because it's automatic. It is in their heart. See, you don't have to teach a person when it's in their heart, but you've got to get the word of God in your heart. And God was showing Israel with these two stone tablets, Israel, this is what your heart is like. I would like to write my entire personality upon your heart, but this is all the farther I can get because your heart is so hard. It is just like this stone. Instead of writing the Ten Commandments on their hearts, again, God spoke through Jeremiah. He wasn't able to do it. Now I want you to notice what he said in chapter 17, verse 1, God's wanting to write his heart on their heart, uh, his word on their heart, but they weren't doing it. Rather, the sin of Judah, Jeremiah 17, 1, is written with a pen of iron and the point of a diamond. It is engraved upon the tablet of their heart. This is what God told them. Their heart was so hard. Their heart had been hardened in and sin had been written on it as if you had etched it with a metal utensil that had a diamond tip. That was God's explanation. That was his revelation to their situation. You see, saints, you do what's written on your heart. That's what you do. If you continue doing something over and over again, you will inscribe that behavior on your heart and it will become normal to you. How many of you have ever been around somebody that they, they may not have even been mad, but they just snapped at you every time they answered you? It was a habit. They didn't maybe mean nothing by it, but they had done this over and over and over until it just became part of who they are. Some people, no matter what the sin is, they keep doing it over and over again until just like a diamond on the tip of a metal pen, it's been written into their heart and their heart needs. I remember when I was a kid that my mom would do ceramics and I remember doing ceramics at school and they would give us this ball of clay and they would say, okay, you know, form it into whatever you want to form it, write on it whatever you want to, but be sure and do what you're going to do before it hardens, because after that, it's too late. How many of you know that it's too late once it hardens? And once our heart gets hardened, saints, we are no longer pliable in the hands of God. You can sit through a thousand messages if your heart is hardened, and it will do you no good. It will have no impact. You can go for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and become no more Christ-like than you were just months after you got saved if your heart is not ready to receive God's word. I remember Brother Birch talking about people saying, well, I've been saved for, for 50 years or 40 years, he said, but a lot of people have a one-year experience 50 times over. They never go forward in God. They never become what God wants them to be. They're no more Christ-like today than they were years ago. Saints, listen, if the Lord spares my life ere many years, I want to be more Christ-like 30 years from now than I am today. Who would agree? Not less. I don't want to get older and older and the next thing you know, I'm this mean, grumpy guy that every time you talk to him, he barks back at you. I want to be more Christ-like than I was then. I look back over my life when I was a young man, a young Christian, I used to think, wow, I was really on fire for God. But then I would think, oh, boy, I didn't react to that situation very good. 
I wouldn't have done that now, what I did then, you see. So I can see where I have grown in the Lord. And I want to continue to grow in the Lord until the Lord takes me home. But that is not going to happen, saints, if I harden my heart before the Lord. That is not going to happen if I'm not careful when the Lord is dealing with me. He is trying to sow some seed into an area of deficiency in my life. And I don't till the ground, let the seed go and let it grow and come forth. You know, if I went out into my front yard or if we go out here in this field over here and there's a bare spot six foot by six foot, we probably may want to fix that unless it's the garden, right? We want to probably fix that. If you've got a spot like that in your yard, you're going to want to fix that. So what do you do? You stir up the soil and you put the seed down because you want it to be the way it's supposed to be. And that's the way God wants our heart to be. He wants us to bring forth fruit. In another figure, he wants his word to be written on our hearts. That way we do his will. It's second nature. We behave like Christ no matter what the circumstances are. And that's the thing. You know, anybody can be a Christian, saints, when everything's going good. Anybody can be a Christian when things are, are just a certain way. Or maybe if you're behind this pulpit, you can be a good Christian. But what about when things are going difficult? What about when people are challenging you? What about when you're facing circumstances that are challenging you? When the word of God is written on your heart, it is a very different situation. You're not having to think about it. You're not having to figure out what should I do. You're responding because God has changed you into his image. So what ended up happening? The people's heart got hard. They got hardened in sin. And then the next thing you know, they were no longer pliable. But God had a solution. I want you to notice this. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. Here's God's solution to man's heart problem. I will give them one heart and a new spirit. And I will put within them a new heart. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh. And I will give them a heart of flesh. You see that? God said, I'm going to reach inside. I'm going to take out that heart of stone. I'm going to take out that heart of stone that's got sin engraved on it with a pen of iron, with a diamond tip. And I'm going to take it out and I'm going to put in a heart of flesh. In other words, a heart that is sensitive, a heart that will receive my word. Verse 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules, that is my laws, and obey them. And they will be my people, and I will be their God. Now that takes us right to our Sunday school lesson this morning. That's God's desire. He wants us to be his people, and he wants to be our God. But our hearts have to be in step with him. God wants to present us holy, faultless, unreprovable, in the presence of God. He wants us to be as Christ-like as we can possibly be. And Paul even talked about that as well. He wanted them to be presented in this way. You see, the new heart, saints, is part of the new covenant that God promised in Jeremiah 31, 33. He's already promised us a new heart. He has promised us a new covenant. Notice what he said in Jeremiah 31, 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. There it is again. I will be their God. They will be my people. God writing the laws on our heart. This is quoted twice in the book of Hebrews alone. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 16. This desire of God, this new covenant that we are under, enables us to have a new heart, a new spirit, and God writing his law on our heart by the Holy Spirit so that we can be 
like Jesus. That's the intention. You see, God said, I will write my law. I will write it in their heart and in their mind. You see, the outcome of this process is that we will walk in God's personality and disposition. We will walk out God's ways. There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. God has a disposition. God has a personality. He has a way about him. And God is trying to form us into that image. The Bible talks about us being changed into that image from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of God. When this happens, Paul told us the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3, Paul said, you are an epistle from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the human heart. Notice what he's saying. You, not your Bible, you are an epistle. You are a letter. You, as it were, are a walking, living, breathing message from God. Your life is an epistle. Your very life communicates God's word. It communicates God's will. You see, the Holy Spirit gives those who truly repent a soft heart that then he can write his laws, his word upon, and we become living examples, saints, of the word of God, a walking, living example of God's word. I don't know how you think about it, saints. I don't think of it as like, oh, you know, I got saved, I've arrived. Oh, I'm good to go. He's not through working on any of us if we are willing to be changed. And I wanna be changed. I wanna be more like Christ tomorrow than I am today. And the only way that can happen is if I allow God's word to be written upon my heart. In another figure, when the word is sown like seed into my life, I allow it to grow and I allow it to become what God wants it to be. If the only epistle that the people around me ever read is my life, what kind of message have I sent to the world? Do you see that? If the only word of God that anyone ever reads is my life, what kind of message have I sent before the Lord? Our life is a manifestation of what's in our heart. Every time we read our Bible, every time we sit through Sunday school class, every time we sit through a sermon, God is trying to write on our heart. He is trying to sow seeds of his word into our personality. But how many times have we walked out of a meeting? How many times have we closed up our Bible and never allowed God to truly do a work, to truly get the job done? It's like he had his pen in his hand. He was almost to the place to where he could write that in your heart. But maybe you say, you know what, I don't have time. I got something else to do. I gotta move on to something different. And you never gave the Lord time to write the word in your heart. So you still struggle in that area. You see, God wants to write his word on our heart and we need to allow him. We need him to allow him and his word to change our personality. And that's the thing. James 1.21 says, Wherefore lay aside all filthiness, it says in the King James, means obscenity, an overflow of mean-spiritedness. Wanted to take people down. How do you know that's not Christ-like? You know, if I put my foot out to trip somebody, I have stumbled them. And that is a dangerous thing to do. I don't want to stumble somebody, saints, with my behavior. And I definitely don't want to stumble them with my deeds. And that's what James is talking about. 
He says, lay aside all the filth, the obscenity, the overflow of mean spiritedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save your soul. Receive the word of God that he is trying to use to change you and to save you. You see, the Greek word for received is dek omai, and it means to accept what is offered readily and deliberately. Listen, saints, nobody accidentally gets changed. You're not going to just passively get changed, right? You're not going to passively get changed. It's going to have to be something that we actively do. We have to determine in our heart and our mind that I'm going to allow God to do a work in my life. We have to be ready to hear God's word. And again, we have to deliberately receive it. We can't be passive. We have to meditate on his word. We have to ponder his word. We have to think about his word and allow God to apply it to our heart by his Holy Spirit. There is no other way for us to be changed. You see, far too often, saints, we're like the person in James. The Bible uses this illustration. He said the person is like a man who's looking into a mirror. He sees himself. We look in the word and God shows us what we look like in the eyes of God. Amen. And we have an opportunity to make corrections, to make alterations. But the person in James, the Bible said, he sees himself, goes his way, and immediately forgets what he looks like. They forget almost immediately. You see, God is trying to show us what we look like before we forget. It does no good for a minister to preach to people who are not willing to receive what is said. I like to preach. But I'm like a farmer. I like to see results. Amen. I want to see results. People will get hardened in what you're saying and you will lose your effectiveness. You will not be effective for God. Why did the farmer plant the field? I already asked it because he wanted a hundred percent. You know, saints, I tremble to think I'll tell you this. I tremble to think how many sermons I've heard in my life. I did a calculation when I was preparing this message that I believe I have heard somewhere in the order of 10,000 sermons in my lifetime. 10,000. That was 10,000 opportunities for God to change something in me. I said behind Brother Birch, I said it just a little bit ago. I said right about would be the equivalent of where that tambourine is sitting. And I would sit and I would watch him three services a week. And this went on for 20 or more years, maybe 25 years. I would sit and hear him and God would speak to my heart. And I tremble to think how many times I walked out and just straight away forgot what God was saying to me. No telling where I may be today in my spiritual walk. If I would have let God deal with me during those times, you see, there are a lot of chances that we have in this life to receive the engrafted word. A lot of chances for the Holy Spirit to change me. He wants to write his law in my heart. He wants to write it in my mind so that I can be like God. He can be my God. I can be his people. But it's up to me and you. What will we do? When I open up my Bible and I'm reading God's word, saints, I never read just so I can say I did it. Yes, amen. I never teach just so I can say I did it. I never preach just so I can say I did it. We call it in the world ticking the box. I don't just tick the box, tick the box, tick the box. Tick the box doesn't get anything accomplished in life, except for you to get to the end and said, oh, I did that X number of times. But the question is, 
Did the intent of it take place? Did the intent. When I open up the word of God or I turn the word tape on in my car, the CD, I'm listening to the word because I want God to change me. I want him to show me something that I didn't already know. I want to learn about God. I want to understand the Bible. This is the purpose. It is never just so I can say I did it and went on and go on uh, to something else. And saints, that's what I think that we need to do. We need to allow God to change our heart and he will change it if we will allow him. I don't want to go 30, 40 years. I don't want to get to the end of my life and I'm a page right out of the book of Jeremiah where God is saying that your heart was hardened. You're, you're, it was just like, like a diamond tip tool that was being used to write. I don't want that in my life. I want God to change me. And I want everybody who I encounter, that I'm around, that I could influence, I want them to be changed too. I want them to be more Christ-like. I want them to be more like Jesus than they were when I first met them. That's my goal, to be more like Christ.